G'day guys, welcome back to Supercoach with DR. For today's video, I'm gonna take a quick look at the top 10 most expensive defenders that we can select in Supercoach 2021. I certainly think we've been blessed with some really nice options down back this year. And I know some guys that are seriously considering even batting four deep in their defensive lines due to all these wonderful options that we've got on our hands. Now, I'm not saying that these blokes are the only blokes you should be looking at or that these blokes are the best 10 defenders or are gonna finish in the top 10 for averages. I'm purely focusing on price at this stage. There are a number of players who I think could push into this list, like Luke McDonald. Donald, Zach Williams, even a Jeremy Howe or a Jaden Short type. But as I said, for this video, I'm focusing purely on the 10 most expensive defenders that we can select this year. So as you can see from this list of players, we've got some breakouts from last year, like your Ridleys, your Maynards, your Callum Mills, and also a couple of guys that we see up there every season, like your Seagulls and your Rory Lairds. But seven out of the 10 actually had career best seasons in regards to average, even the Seagull did. He beat his best career average by 10.2 points, Ryan by 11.5, Maynard a really nice jump, 22.5. Talk about a breakout season. This goal is the definition of a breakout last year. Jordan Ridley, he beat his previous average by 35.9 points. Smashed that out of the park. Daniel continued his upward trajectory by 2.4 points. Mills, another breakout from last season, 19.6 points. And Thomas Stewart continued in the right direction as well, albeit not as much as someone like a Mills or a Ridley. He beat his previous average by 1.9 points. So another interesting thing to look at is who started as the most expensive defenders back in 2019 and 2020. So we need to try to look for some patterns here. And the first thing that I see is Jake Lloyd there, most expensive defender in 2019, again in 2020, and he's followed it up for a third season in a row by being the most expensive defender going into 2021. You also see Rory Laird there, second in 2019, again in the top 10 for 2020, and finds himself as the third most expensive defender going into this year. So they're two blokes that certainly have a lot of runs on the board. The other thing I notice about this crop is that there's not too many blokes that are sort of getting over the hill or are gonna fall off a cliff. Someone like a Shannon Hearn last year completely fell off a cliff after having really good seasons in 2019 and 2020 as well. If you look back to 2019 as well, we've got players like Shaw, Suckling, Simpson, and they were all probably getting past their best. And that was obvious because in 2020, they were nowhere near the top 10 in regards to price or in regards to average also. The other guys that you see there with a tick in 2020 is Daniel and Stewart because they're also starting in the top 10 in regards to starting prices in 2021 also. So that's another thing that I like about these two blokes is the fact that they do have some runs on the board. But if we look at this top 10 list here, there's no blokes, I think, that don't have their best football in front of them. So that's why I think it's a really, really exciting list of players to choose from. Now, it'll be no surprise to anyone that the most expensive midfielder going into this year is the Seagull Jay Cloyd. He'll set you back 656400 I'm not going to spend too much time on him because I did put out a quick video about a week ago explaining why I think he's an absolute lock going into this year. He's the most expensive defender from 2018 up to 2020 and again in 2021. There's a reason for that. He produces elite numbers similar to those of an elite midfielder and he's just too good to leave out of our defensive lines. Don't be scabby, don't try to save cash on this bloke, just lock him in and maybe look for some value options elsewhere. Next on the list, we've got Luke Ryan. So he'll set you back 576,500, the second highest averaging defender from last year, had a really good season. He takes a lot of the kick-ins from Fremantle, an intercept sort of defender with a pretty nice disposal on him as well. Tends to make pretty good decisions also, I think. You can see there that he's got averages of 76.8, 90.2, 95.8, and 107.3. So for the last three years, he's gone that 90 plus average. For me, I think he's probably a little bit expensive to start with. And the other issue I've got with Ryan is that he does have a pretty low floor. Unlike Laird, whose lowest score in three years was 72, I think he's got about 10 scores under 72 and is prone to throw in sort of a 40 to a 50 here and there also. So for those players that we're going to pay a high price for, I like to stay away from those blokes that have that lower type of floor. Coming in at number three, we have Rory Laird. He'll set you back 564000 900 comes with the added bonus for having DPP status this year can be selected in our midfield lines if we choose to do so But I am a huge huge fan of this pick. He's missed a consistency He's been right up there in the averages all the way from 2015 93.8 96.8 100.2 in 2018 had his career best year of 108.2 I think he'll actually have his career best year this year or I certainly think he's got the potential to do so and I'll tell you why in a minute 
96.8, bit of a down year in 2019, and then back up to 105.1 in 2020. Now, what I love about this pick also is the fact that he's got a really, really high floor. How's this for a stat? His lowest Supercoach score in the last three years was a 72. So I'll take that every day of the week, particularly from someone that we can be selecting as a defender. So someone that certainly got runs on the board. And the other great thing about selecting Rory Laird this year is I think we are selecting him as Rory Laird, the midfielder, not the halfback flanker. And that's great because we know that in round nine last year, he did move into the midfield and managed to average 118 for the rest of the season. So if he can go anywhere near that this year, I think he'll be an awesome, awesome selection. And I actually think that he's got a smidgen of value to him as well. Because remember, it did take until round nine for him to move into that new midfield role. And he didn't have a great start to the season back there in the back line. So other people may disagree with that and say that I don't think there's much value there because there is risk that he goes back to that defensive role. But look, to be quite honest, I think, and this is absolute worst, at an absolute worst case scenario, he'll average you a 95 back there in the defensive line. I certainly think even as a defender, he could go 100 to 105 pretty easily. But as a midfielder, I've got pretty high hopes for Rory Laird. And I think he'd go probably anywhere from a 110 all the way up to 120. So in my humble opinion, I think he's a great selection and currently locked for me as my D2. Next on the list, we have Lockie Whitfield. He'll set you back 561,600. Again, I'm a fan of this bloke. Look at those averages from 2017 up to 2020. 97.6, 99.9, 111.2, and a 104.5. Obviously available as a defender this year after having DPP status a mid forward last year. I think he's someone who we need to have a really, really close look at. Certainly does have some risk attached to him. That's mainly in regards to his durability. And I'll take you through some numbers in a minute. But one thing I really like about Whitfield is that he's an accumulator. He uses the ball well, loves those one twos, and he is an endurance beast. And given the fact we're going back to those 20 minute quarters now, that suits him down to a T. That's his strength. He just keeps running all day. And that's another reason why he's really, really hard to tag. There's not too many other players in the comp that can actually keep up with this bloke. But as I said, I do have a concern and that's about his durability. So obviously in 2020, he managed to play every game, which is great for someone like Whitfield. But then if you go back to 2016, we can see that from round 17 to 19, he was out of action at a really frustrating time of the season, particularly for super coaches. So that's a three week period that he missed out on there. In 2017, missed the first seven rounds due to injury. So he didn't start until round eight, seven games gone there. In 2018, came back, Looked a bit more durable, played every game during that season. And then we go to 2019, where he missed another chunk of football here from rounds 12 to 16. So that's another four-week period. So what that says to me is that when he misses football, he does miss chunks of football. And for non-owners, that can be a really good thing because generally there's an injury-affected game in there. We can get him cheaper. Just like last year, we managed to get him in a really, really solid price. And then he got back on the horse and managed to really continue to bump up that average for the rest of the year. So a concern for me is his durability and probably the only reason why he's in an absolute lock. Now, unless you're looking to tank this year, do not select James Sisley. He's out with his knee. Really unfortunate for him. Really unfortunate for Hawthorne supporters as well. Because this guy is a gun defender. I started him last year. A little bit of a yo-yo. He can go really, really big. But then he has those games where he might move forward or someone gets in his head and he's pretty useless. But cross him off your list for this year. Maybe look to get him in cheaply in 2022. Next up is Braden Maynard, the type of bloke you'd love playing for your football club. One thing that he'll bring each week is 100% effort, a really uncompromising sort of defender. Look at his price, 549900 At the start of last preseason, if you had told me that this bloke would have been the top 10 averages for defenders, I would have said you're absolutely having a laugh. But he proved me wrong, hit the ton in the first five of his games last year, really started well, tapered off a little bit from time to time during the season, but generally a pretty consistent defender. Only had the one score in the 60s, I think. The rest was sort of those 70 to 80 type scores for his lowest. So hasn't got an ultra low floor, which is always good, but I like to see a little bit more from him. And look, if I'm going to select a Collingwood defender, I'm probably looking a little bit more closely at someone like a Jeremy Howe, who started really well last year. Always a risk coming back from a long-term injury, I know. But I'd be looking at someone like him over a Maynard, because even someone like a Howe's got a few more runs on the board than him. The seventh most expensive defender is Jordan Ridley. He'll set you back 547,700. As we said, a real breakout year last year. Only played nine games in between 2018 to 2019. But in 2020, took out the Essendon BNF. Was a real general in the back line there. 
absolutely elite disposal. That's one thing that really stands out if you ever watch Jordan Ridley. Just makes good decisions with ball in hand. And 99 out of 100 times, might be exaggerating a little bit, but he will hit the target. Now, my main issue with Ridley, well, I've got a couple of issues. The first thing is that we've only seen one season of really good exposed form. I always like to see at least a couple of seasons before I look to select them at a high starting price. And this is the other thing. Towards the end of the season, he did lose some consistency and became a bit of a yo-yo. So we see there in round 11, 124, 70, 115, 76, 136, 73, 119, than a 64. So that does concern me. If I'm selecting someone at a top 10 price, I want someone that's going to be consistent from week to week. Every player throws in a bad score here to there. But as you can see there, the pattern was one week on and one week off for Ridley. So for me at this stage, it's a no as a starting pick. Now, one thing you're going to get with Caleb Daniel, I think, is a consistent score from week to week. He doesn't go really low. He also doesn't go really, really high. So a pretty high floor, but not the biggest of ceilings. But he is a model of consistency. We see those averages, 99.1, 101.5. I'm pegging him in for anywhere between 100 to probably 103 this year. It's been said that with the addition of Chalor, that some of these dogs may miss out on points. I've heard a bit of discussion about Daniel maybe losing some points, but I don't think Chalor is going to affect him or any of the dogs midfielders are going to affect him. He's got a really good role down back, a solid and consistent role. He's a distributor out of the back line, and I certainly don't see any reason for him to go totally backwards. For me, he's going to be one of those blokes that you select, not to expect those huge scores from, but just someone that you're going to lock in and give you some consistent scores from week to week. Next on the list, we've got Callum Mills from the Sydney Swans. He'll set you back 544,900. A real breakout season for him last year. Previous best average of 81.8 in 2019. And he's now up that to 101.4 in 2020. What I like about his scoring trajectory is it does seem to be going up each year. So 73, 79, 81, and then that big jump to 101. What we've been waiting for Mills, it's similar to Isaac Heaney. When is this bloke going to start playing through the midfield? He was drafted as an elite midfielder, and when he has shown little glimpses in the midfield, he's been absolutely terrific. You know, he's tough as nails, extremely courageous, but my main concern with him is the fact that he's such a good defender. And if I was Horse Longmire, I would be loath to actually take him out of that defensive unit. But if this bloke gets a bit of a look in the midfield going into 2021, I think he could be a really, really good selection. The issue I've got with him, and it's similar to a Ridley, it's similar to a Maynard, we've only seen that one good year of exposed form, so he may be an upgrade target if he sets the world on fire at the start of the year, maybe look to get him in early, but for me, I'd probably stay away from him as a starting pick, even though he had a really good season last year. And the last bloke we're going to discuss today is the 10th most expensive defender, and that is Tommy Stewart. I think similar to Caleb Daniel, he's a bit of a model of consistency. We'll never go too low, but the other thing is he doesn't really have a huge ceiling. He did have a really nice game where he pulled out a 145 the week before I actually brought him in last year. And there may be a little bit of value with him because he did have an injury-affected score of 18. I was wrapped when I brought him in. I think he gave me a 60 ad on debut. I was a bit disappointed with that, but for some reason had some really low time on ground. And after round 11, he did not dip below the tonne for the rest of the season. So as I said, a really consistent pick, got a solid role down there, dual all Australian now, was obviously drafted as a mature age pick. I think he may have been in the Geelong VFL side, not quite sure about that, but I'm pretty sure he was. And he's been a wonderful selection for Geelong. I think he'll be a really, really safe pick this year and certainly someone that I'd recommend having a really, really good look at. So thanks for watching as always, guys. That were just some of my quick thoughts on the top 10 most expensive defenders going into 2021. Thank you to everyone that has been active in the comments section. Please let me know who you're looking to start this year. I love hearing your thoughts, love hearing your feedback, because often there's times where you'll bring up points that I hadn't even considered yet. So thank you again to all the people who've been really active down there in the comments section. As I said, in the next week or two, I will put out another video focusing more on those value options. If there's any players in particular that you'd like me to take more in-depth review on, more than happy to do that. I did want to keep this video to about the 15 minute mark. I know that George has put a really good video out on Luke McDonald, who I think will be another great pick this year. But apart from that, guys, thanks very much for watching again. Feel free to leave a like, feel free to subscribe. If you have missed out on any preseason content, feel free to go back and check out those other videos. But if not, I'll keep it pumping and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, guys. See you soon. Bye.